Hi guys, hi everyone, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are from. So my guest today is uh, Philip Shepard. Hi, Philip. Hi, pleasure to be here. Thank uh, you. Nice to have you as a guest. Mm -hmm. And Philip is uh, recognized as a leader in the global embodiment movement. He's the creator of the Embodied Present Process, which is super interesting. I think we should touch upon that. I hope so. Uh, which provides a fresh mm -hmm. philosophical overview of how our culture desensitizes our thinking and a wealth of practices to help people come home to the bottomless intelligence of the embodied mind. Uh, he shares uh, TEPP, which is the Embodied Present Process, um, worldwide through in-person workshops and facilitators trainings, and has articulated the need for a new, more embodied way of being in uh, three, uh, well, the new embodied way of being in three books, a Radical uh, Wholeness, New Self, New World, and Deep Fitness, co-authored with Andrei Yakovenko. And the topic today is actually phrase very interestingly, lower your consciousness. So uh, hi once again, and now that the official part <laughs> is over, I can breathe out and start interacting properly. <laughs> I want to ask straight away, uh, lower your consciousness. It's a very unusual way of, um, of this phrase. I mean, usually when we talk about consciousness, we talk more about that. Can you, I, I'm sorry if it's, it's, if it's straight into something deep and I love philosophical conversations, so I don't think it's a problem, but uh, what does it mean? So there's a very large context to this and I think it's worth, it's worth pointing out. Um, our consciousness, our center of thinking 10,000 years ago was in the belly. So we actually felt our thinking in the belly. And what happened was, you know, that was, that was in a culture that gathered around the mother and honored the earth and was, was in such harmony with nature that it was deemed the original leisure society because, you know, they'd spend 15, you know, maybe 20 hours a week at most taking care of their needs and the rest was what we deem leisure time and what happened when we when we discovered agriculture everything changed all of our relationships changed so you imagine the first person to take a seed and push it into the earth and pat it down and suddenly that bit of ground belongs to them and the little green shoot growing up beside your seed is now a weed and there have never been weeds before but now it has to be killed and pulled out and and the animal coming along is now vermin and it might eat your plant so it has to be killed and the tree growing beside your plant is putting your plant in shade so it has to be killed and cut down so so everything changed and we started to invest in controlling the world rather than being in harmony with it. And as that happened, our consciousness, the center of our consciousness began to rise in the body. So in Homer's day, it's in the chest. And you can see that clearly in his writings. And mm -hmm. in Plato's day, there's a dialogue, speaking of philosophy, that Plato wrote, Timaeus, in which this wise man, Timaeus, is asked, how, how did the gods fashion human beings? Mm -hmm. And Timaeus responded, well, first they, they fashioned this divine orb based on the spheres of the heavens. And then they realized this divine orb wouldn't be able to get around. So they grew it a vehicle, arms and legs and a trunk. Mm -hmm. So there we are. This is like 350 BC. And the body is already being described as a vehicle. And the head is being described as the divinest part of us. And what happened as we moved up into the head and our consciousness went higher and higher is we came out of connection with ourselves, with the world, so that we, you know, we look at the world as though through a, a window, like it's out here and I'm in here. But, but the essence of our relationship with the world is that it lives through us in every moment. And there is no separation. There's no me in here and the present is out there. Um, so to come back into harmony, into felt relationship 
with the world around us, for me anyway, we need to find our way back to the body. And the, you know, the body is not a vehicle. The body processes over a billion times more information than we can be consciously aware of. And normally that sort of hums through our unconscious, but, but to drop into the body is to be informed by all that, to be guided by the present rather than sitting in your head strategizing about it. Mm. So when you use the word lower, it means actually geographically in the body, lower from head down back to where it came from. Yeah, there's another side to that as well. I mean, yes, absolutely. It's like into the body. But the other side of that is because of this journey that we made up into our heads, our entire culture is inflected around a value system that says up is good and down is bad. Mm -hmm. You're looking up today. You know, there's no ambiguity about what that means in another culture. That could mean you're you're looking a little flighty and disconnected. Are you okay? Or or I might say you're looking a little low today. And we know what that means. In another culture, that could mean you're looking at peace with yourself and at rest on the earth. So so in our bodies we have encoded that up is good and down is bad. And one of the consequences of that is our aspirations are up, more, higher, better. And we have lost our connection with the earth in such a way that, you know, the intelligence of the legs in our culture is almost silenced. So the legs are experienced as prosthetics that perambulate the body around. Mm -hmm. And, and they, are, they are the conduits to the earth. They are what ground us to that maternal energy that keeps us alive. So you said that this transformation of our consciousness or not transformation, the journey of our consciousness from, from the stomach to the chest to the head, it happened over time. But I believe that the world that we live in also was created over time, but by us humans. So uh, in a way, the world where we live right now versus the world where uh, people lived 10, 12, uh, 30,000 years ago, they're very, very different worlds. So is it possible to drop back into our bodies to lower, to slow down in the contemporary world? Or is it something which is now practiced more as a, uh, I don't know, well, I wouldn't want to call it a hobby, but something which, which doesn't have space in everyday life? Let, let me put it this way. In practical life, sorry, not everyday, I meant practical. No, I, t I totally understand. Um, the mode by which we operate is if I can get through this, I'll feel better later. And we live our yes. lives like that. If I can get through this, I'll feel better later. And later never comes or rarely comes because there's always something still to move towards. And, and so, you know, is it possible um, to live that way in, in everyday life? It is if you give yourself permission to feel good. So, so every practice that I share is, is shared because I feel better. I feel better when I release the whole body to my breath. I feel better when I let my energy settle on the earth. I feel better when I think with the whole of my being rather than racing around in my head, trying to, trying to win, trying to get it right. Um, so, but it, it, it's not a small thing to allow ourselves to feel good because our, our commitment is to doing. We, you know, there's this polarity between doing and being, and we have, we sacrifice being in order mm -hmm. to um, do because the, because our necessity is doing. We don't, we don't accord very much importance to being. Mm -hmm. But we and are feel, human beings. And the feeling good uh, as well, by the way, because if you look at um, at the contemporary discourse, people actually uh, talk about, you know, that uh, success requires sacrifice, right? Sacrifice is something which you give up uh, to... For, for the for the better future it is looking into the future i don't i don't say anything against sacrifice per se but what i'm saying that uh 
we actually live in the society where being being or feeling good is very often opposed to success and if uh, you were to ask anyone would you like to be successful would you like to feel good most people would choose success i guess i guess i mean it's a strange thing right now it's a yeah. and it's a huge impediment and and our understanding what we've internalized is that i will feel good once i'm successful yes but success is always measured by external values by other people and you're never the most successful there's always somebody more successful than you and so the striving is endless and meanwhile you know in that choice that we make between feeling good or being successful we we make the choice without taking into account what we are sacrificing mm -hmm. so so for example I believe our culture is blind to wholeness. Now, all there is, is wholeness. You know, everything affects everything. Everything influences everything. But, you, you know, what does it mean to speak from your wholeness? What does it mean to listen from your wholeness? What does and it by mean wholeness, I, be, I believe you don't mean just your personal wholeness, but wholeness as in connection with the world, right? Yeah, because there's no such thing as personal wholeness. There is only relationship. That's all there is, mm -hmm. right? So we've got this fallacy, you know, to be whole in body, mind, and spirit. And it sounds wonderful as though, you know, the self were composed of these three um, uh, sort of aspects. And if each of them could be nourished and brought into harmony, you would be whole. No, wholeness is about relationship. There, there's, no, um, there's no way to self-organize yourself into wholeness and and we've got this you know that's what the doing or our commitment to the doing mode tells us that your your job is to organize yourself in the most successful way possible mm -hmm. now if you're organizing yourself you're in a state of division there's the part of you that knows how you want to feel and, and is sorting out what's right and 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 what's going to win and you make the rest of you accord with that. For example, you know, it's important to breathe deeply. So you make yourself take a deep breath, but you're in division. I would never say to someone, take a deep breath because the head knows exactly what that means and how it happens and makes the body do it. So we are dominating this fathomless, sensitized wealth of intelligence and rendering it mute. And as that happens, we feel disconnected and anxious and estranged and and we have no sense of being clearly located in this place at this moment we we've forgotten what it means to be present mm -hmm. so another interesting aspect of contemporary life is that we are actually quite separated from well nature at least nature uh, I believe that uh, if you put a modern person somewhere in the forest, they wouldn't survive. I don't think that ancient people would survive alone very well, but at least they'd probably survive a little longer than the modern person. Uh, so is, is that also uh, influencing our, uh, I don't know, perception of wholeness? Because we are, we are in a different environment. We do have layers between us and the, well, even if we, I, and I don't want to go into controversial topics, but even when, when pandemic hit, uh, that natural thing, I, well, I believe some kind of diseases are generally natural, actually made us uh, create layers and layers just to, to you know, to, to feel safe, to feel safe, uh, separated from, from something which is a natural part of worth of, of the world that's of course provided that you don't think that uh, <laughs> that the virus was created in the laboratory sorry i don't want to, to talk about uh, that i want to talk about how far mm. we are from from uh, the natural world so so all there is is relationship like even even an electron electron doesn't exist except through its relationships that's what mm -hmm grants it its existence so so what happens is um the template 
or the model for all of our relationships, I believe, is our relationship with the body. It is our most intimate relationship with our own life. Now, if our relationship with the body is top down, if it is one that upholds division, then we will apply that model to all of our other relationships. Mm -hmm. So you're alone in the forest and you are in your head trying to figure out where you are and what you should do. And that is not a, a good strategy for survival. If you can drop down into the body and feel where you are and begin to sensitize it, you will feel where water is that you would need to drink. You will feel the animals around you. You will feel where danger is just by attuning. You know, um, there's a there's a, a culture in North America called the Okanagan culture, um, mm -hmm. indigenous culture. And their word for insane literally translates as talking, talking inside the head. And that's mm -hmm. all we do is talk, talk inside the head. And there, you know, a, a, an Aboriginal hunter gatherer will tell you that when they are moving through the woods, there are no words in their head. They are feeling, they are attuning. So what we've done is we've said, we can know the world and knowledge is the most important thing. And, you know, I can look around the room I'm in. There's nothing I don't know here. I know what everything is. So then, and I, I can look out my window. I know what everything there is as well. So I don't need to feel any of it. Why would you bother feeling what you already know? So we've put all our eggs in the basket of knowing, 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 and we've come out of felt relationship. So I know that's a tree out my window, but it's a very different thing for me to feel its presence. And as I feel its presence, my presence is illuminated by that. And, and to shift the allegiance from having to know to a willingness to feel, again, that is the means by which we come back to ourselves, by which we come back to the earth, to wherever we happen to be on it. So how does this process happen? Uh, I just, uh, because even now listening to you or asking the questions, it is a cognitive process in the sense we, we do think you said you said an interesting thing if you wanted a person to take a deep breath you wouldn't tell them to do that because that creates a separation because your head kind of tells the body to take a deep breath so how does this process work do you uh naturally take a deep breath if you don't think about anything or um no no because our bodies have been patterned um the breath is interrupted um, people, you know, the, if you want to get technical, and why not? Um, Anatomical. <laughs> yeah, so there's the diaphragm in the chest, and everyone yeah. talks about that. But the pelvic floor is a diaphragm. It's technically a diaphragm. The pelvic floor is meant to move with the thoracic diaphragm. And what happens in our culture, it gets locked up. I mean, down is bad. We don't feel what is down in our bodies. Um, and, and, and what happens as it gets locked up is our breath naturally goes shallow and becomes willful. Mm -hmm. A baby, you look at a baby breathing, and it's like the baby's body just releases to the in-breath and releases to the out-breath. And that release is initiated by the release of the pelvic floor. So this is, I mean, we're talking about thousands of years of conditioning and moving up into the head that has that has bled through our culture into each of us so you know for example can you recover for yourself sensation on the pelvic floor i mean it's highly innervated there's no reason not to feel it but people have difficulty with that they have difficulty feeling when it's tense they have difficulty releasing it to the breath so what I'll say, I would never say take a deep breath, but I will say release your body to the in-breath, release your body to the out-breath. 
and it's a surrender. You know, it's, you release the body the way you'd release a leaf to a breeze, and it just goes, and it's carried by the breath. And then, you know, there's a sense of slightly being out of control as that happens. Well, yes, but, you know, there's a, there's a tension between control and harmony because the opposite of harmony is order. And you're mm -hmm. trying to impose order where there should be harmony. That's a very interesting statement. The opposite of harmony is order. Can we go a little deeper into that? It's, it's super curious because I would imagine that the opposite of order is, I don't know, chaos. The opposite of harmony is, well, <laughs> that's an interesting statement. Yeah, so, so um, there's a movement called Naked Streets and there was a town, Christianfeld, <laughs> in Denmark uh -huh. where there's this one intersection that they that that was it was like three fatal pedestrian fatalities a year uh -huh. and they looked at this and said how can we solve this and what they did was they took away all the stoplights all the signs all the demarcations between the pedestrians mm -hmm. and the cars they took away all um means of establishing order mm -hmm. well now people mm -hmm. come come into it and instead of being told what to do by the sign, they have to notice what is around them and respond and, and adjust. And fatalities went from an average of three a year to zero. Mm -hmm. And that's, do you know what a murmuration of starlings is? You get these birds, like a quarter of a million birds flying mm -hmm. in this. So that's, that is harmony. Every bird is yielding without resistance to every other bird. Every bird is attuned to its environment. It is the most astonishing display of harmony. And what we do is we, you know, since, since we discovered agriculture, we've been wanting to um, impose order because we feel safe when we impose order. And, and, you know, ultimately what we do is we build a prison for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, safety, it's a great concept, but, I don't know. What I've noticed in my years on this earth is that life isn't safe. I mean, you get sick, you get injured, you lose a loved one, you die. Life is not safe. But what we do, you know, we understand that. So the conclusion we draw is, well, life isn't safe. So maybe if I'm less alive, I'll be more safe. Mm -hmm. And so we, we diminish our lives in search of safety and and you know as we do that we we become less and less present mm -hmm. uh, i definitely relate to the idea of um of more trouble coming out of the desire to harness the, <laughs> the instability or, or uncertainty of life or not, not it not being safe so would it be correct also to think that uh, we also try to keep our bodies in order and through that we are losing harmony with, with absolutely we're trying to fix our bodies i mean mm -hmm. it hurts and you want to fix it um you know there We, we take so much energy in the body and put it on hold and it's stored in the body as tension. And that, that quality of putting the energy on hold is because we don't want to feel it in the moment. So we don't want that energy to come in contact with our being. Mm -hmm. But you think, go back to the murmuration of starlings. You think of a lone starling, not part of the murmuration and it is reactive and nervous and alone, and then it joins the murmuration and its flight is harmonized by the whole. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have separated our body into compartments. I mean, I know what it is to be analytical and I know what it is to be romantic and feel from the heart, but they don't go together. And the intelligence of the legs is separate from the intelligence of the head. And the, the knowing in the belly is separate from the, the you know, sensitivity of the hands. That we, we, we've, we've, we've cordoned off, we've, we've compartmentalized the body. And what that, what that does is it makes it impossible 
to feel wholeness if you are not in wholeness. And, and again, wholeness isn't something you can achieve. I mean, we want, we want to know what to do, what to achieve. You that is my next question, by the way, so we can start right. answering that. <laughs> all right. You can't achieve wholeness because, because it's all there is. You're held in it at every moment, mm. right? So you can't make it happen. All you can do is surrender to it. It's already there. And that surrendering is that recognition and undoing of patterns that we are unaware of in the body because we, we've, we've taken them in from our culture as instructions from infancy. And there are layers and layers of instructions that we have encoded within our neurology that prevent us from feeling wholeness, prevent us from speaking from wholeness, from thinking with the whole of our being. So what are some of such instructions which we and patterns which we need to undo? Um, thinking happens in the head. Mm -hmm. As soon as you as soon as you understand that, um, then there is thinking and being, and they are two different things. This is this is an, this is artificial and destructive. There's a Latin verb sentire that means to think, to feel. Thinking and feeling are one. And I feel every thought through my body. And as my thinking passes through my body, it's like a, an echo chamber that clarifies each thought as it, as it surfaces. So I feel every thought and I recognize every feeling in my body as a form of thinking. And, you know, then what is a thought? Again, we've, 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 um, we've got erroneous ideas about what thought is, about what intelligence is, uh, about what wholeness is. Um, thought is the processing of a relationship. And that can be in an abstract way. What's the relationship between one and one? Well, if you add them together, you get two. If you subtract one from the other, you get zero. Thought is the processing of a relationship. And the body is processing your relationships with the world, with the present at an astonishing rate. Um, what about intelligence? We know that intelligence is the ability to reason in an abstract fashion. Well, that's a, such a tiny part of our intelligence. It's ridiculous. I mean, yes, it's important, but there's this vast spectrum that I would call sensitivity to begin with. I think mm -hmm. any sensitivity is a form of intelligence, and that can be a sensitivity to, to the scent of a flower, to a child's tears, to bird song. Any sensitivity is a form of intelligence. Now, the thing with a sensitivity is that it is necessarily reactive. If the, if the retina didn't react to light, we wouldn't see. So that reactivity has to be grounded in order to become coherent. And that grounding happens through the body. So I would say intelligence is grounded sensitivity. Now, if you, if you understand intelligence in that way, then you look at our school system and you realize this, this institution that, that purports to nurture a child's intelligence is undermining it. It is desensitizing the children to their bodies, to, to their needs, and, and it is leaving them ungrounded. I mean, that's the effect of these 12 years of schooling. So we are, we are diminishing the intelligence of our kids as they pass through this, this training that says, sit still in the chair, fill your head with the right ideas. If, you're, if you can't control your body's energy, you get in trouble. So, you know, I don't see any difference between the body's energy and the body's intelligence. And so mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're suppressing the body's intelligence and saying it has no place, it has no value. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I would say mm -hmm. that uh, it starts before school. <laughs> I think uh, yeah. well-meaning parents often also desensitize their children mm -hmm. accidentally. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, if we talk about uh, body as, uh, as this processing 
machinery, right? That that kind of carries the intelligence. Uh, I can imagine kids uh, running around and dancing and climbing the walls. It's not quite natural for uh, for the grown-ups, yet we do still have some sensations in our bodies and. Um, we, we, I guess we, we adhere to, to social norms a little more, so we wouldn't burp or, or do nasty sounds in public. So what does it mean? Uh, how, how do we get the sensitivity back? How do we, how do we um, allow our bodies to just be without squeezing them into the boundaries of discipline or whatever it is? Yeah, um, there are two, there are kind of two parts that I'd, I'd love mm -hmm. to bring forward. One is, we live with a myth of aloneness. We are told that we are each essentially alone and that it's important to be independent. And the problem with that is that there's no such thing as independence. I would banish the word from the English <laughs> language. It, you, you can't show me one example of independence in the cosmos. Everything affects everything. Everything leans on everything. But as soon as you accept that you're alone, then your experience is strictly private. It's just in here. It's not that my heartbeat is felt anywhere else or my thoughts have any. No, my experience is strictly private. And then my number one job in life is to organize my private experience to make it successful. So now I take the, the spotlight of my intelligence and I turn it off the world and onto myself. And I cast the world in darkness and I am now divided. There's the part of me that is doing the organizing, the part of me being organized. And I, we organize everything. We organize our, our thoughts. We organize our emotions. We organize our responses. We organize our agendas. And there's a place for organization. But what happens is we bind ourselves in self-consciousness. And that's the source of this running commentary in the heads. It, it's We are conscious of the self. We are commenting. You know, we spend more time thinking about our thoughts about the world than we do thinking about the world itself. And, and when you're bound in self-consciousness, your primary relationship in all the universe is between the divided parts of yourself. That's what occupies your, your time and your energy. Meanwhile, you know, if you could find the courage and the humility and the boldness to take your attention off yourself and let it dilate into the present and rest there, you move out of the fallacy of self-regulation into relationship, into being regulated by the present, by its peace, by its harmony, by its currents of mindfulness. And so that, you know, that, that's a huge thing to understand on an existential level that there is no such thing as aloneness. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is that if all there is is relationship, the quality of felt relationship is gentleness. When you really want to feel something, be gentle with it. And that, you know, if you're if you move a baby's arm gently into a sleeve, you're feeling the whole baby, you're moving with it. And so, you know, gentleness doesn't have um, a very high standing in our culture, but what would happen if you allowed yourself to feel your breath as gently as possible? If you just took a moment to feel it gently and more gently, more gently and suddenly there is a blossoming of feeling of yourself of presence and to feel the you know the floor on which you're resting as gently as you can and to feel you know any little aches and pains in the body as gently as you can and to to understand that that we want we want protect and armor and shut in, but we're ultimately um, not just protecting ourselves, but diminishing ourselves as we do that. And the doorway that opens us into the world to 
you know, to look at a tree as gently as you can, to feel its presence as gently as you can. That is the doorway into felt relationship, which is so much richer and more nourishing than known relationship that we've been taught to seek. Mm -hmm. I, I do feel like I need to clarify. Uh, I, of course, I understand the word gently, especially when you're talking about baby and the sleeve. Uh, but when it comes to feeling uh, your body gently or seeing a tree outside my window gently, what, what makes it a gentle observation versus uh, forced? I yeah, good. imagine. Um, as soon as you want to feel it gently, you drop down into the body. You can't, you can't sit in the head and see it from the head. Gentleness is felt. It's felt in the body. So, so we, again, you, you, you said, what are these, what are some of these, um, um, impediments that we've been, uh, given by our culture? Mm -hmm. We have five senses and that's pretty obvious, except that it's also a cultural artifact. There are other cultures that have different senses. Um, there's the Anglo Eve culture in Africa, mm -hmm. and their word for sense, I mean, they don't really have a word for sense, but the closest they have is Sesilalame, which translates literally as feel, feel at flesh inside. Mm -hmm every sense is felt through the body so for example they have a a word that means to hear from the ear but that's not real hearing real mm -hmm. hearing is when you feel the sounds of the world through the body real seeing is when you feel the sights of the world through the body and that's the doorway that gentleness opens us to so we're not you know we're not stopping our uh processing the world our awareness of the world up here we are letting it down into the body so you mentioned tap or the embodied present process yes <laughs> and and that's that's what that's what the, that name is pointing to that it's not that i'm here and the present is out there and i'm trying to i'm trying to connect with it the present lives within me and even when i hear bird song that sound is moving through my body and i can feel it with the whole of my being or i can note it up here and i can say oh that's a cardinal or whatever it might be i can i can look out my window and say oh that's a tree or i can feel its presence in a way that recognizes that it's out there even as I'm feeling its presence within my being. And it's gentleness that makes that experience possible. It's one mm -hmm. of the qualities. So I, I feel I'm going to ask a little bit uh, funny question considering our conversation, because you did mention <laughs> that, uh, that uh, this process requires um, surrender. So rather than cognitively get or understand analytically or, or critically understand the, the thing you have to surrender, to, to, to feel. Uh, so does that also mean that uh, you can come back to your body or to feeling with your body, uh, to sensing with your body uh, suddenly through a certain experience or is it a practice that you need to keep practicing and if you don't do, you, uh, you lose this ability again? I mean, I think you can come back to it with a sudden experience, but I don't think it'll, it'll stay. And one of the reasons for that is our our habits are so strong and they're so strongly reinforced by our culture. I mean, our language, you know, two heads are better than one. We don't say two hearts are better than one. No, the head, it's all about the head. You know, in English, the word captain comes from the Latin word for head. Any, any leader of any organization is the head. What is a car? A car is a head on wheels. I mean, that's why it has two headlights, because we have two eyes and we need we need to feel that model of 
the way we live in our, our heads, we need to feel that as we get inside our cars because it's very familiar and very comforting. So the, I mean, it's all over and over and over. The, you know, the way we build our houses, they're all compartmentalized. There's the bathroom and the bedroom and they're all, and, and, and that's, again, that's arbitrary, but it's, it's how the bodies are all compartmentalized. So it's, it's, it's comforting and familiar. A Japanese house, traditionally, there, there are screens that slide in. You need a room, you slide the screens. There's the room. Then you s slide them back. It, it's, it's permeable. Our bodies are permeable, but we want to lock them into this um, prison of compartments and, and safety. Um, mm -hmm. so, so now I've forgotten your question. Um, it was, uh, is it is it a sudden experience? Is it a practice you have to keep doing to to keep being not in your head but stay in your belly? So there are there are five qualities of being, mm -hmm. and when you come back to your being, you come back to those qualities. Um, so. Being is inherently spacious and your body is inherently spacious. And you know, you take the hardest thing on earth and you look into it and it's more than 99% empty space. And we lose our sense of spaciousness as we become contracted and congested and filled with, with the, the troubles of our life. And and as that happens, we contract into aloneness. So spacious is one quality. And, and to remember that, to remember that your reality is spacious. The reality of your being is spacious. And the reality of your being is fluid. You're 90, I know you're 65% water. Mm -hmm. You are actually 65% water. You are a fluid being. And we lose the body's fluidity as we hold it in these contained patterns and to release the body to the breath is to feel the the breath sort of recovering the body's fluidity drawing it back into fluidity and as soon as the body is fluid you begin to lose that hard barrier that separates you from the world and it i mean you can't be separated from the world but you can desensitize to that permeability and then you believe you're separate from the world and fluidity is inherent in everything that there's nothing that is fixed and eternal and solid um, everything is in flow even even a diamond or granite it, there's 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 flow there everything is fluid and the other qualities are groundedness i mean every tall tree you know, is is rooted in the earth. We are held to the bosom of the earth, and we have lost our groundedness as our as our consciousness has gone higher and higher. We we forget even what it means to be at rest. I, if you're living in your head, it's impossible to be at rest. It's only when you come back into relationship with the earth that you truly find rest. So you're. You know, you can't self-regulate into rest. You come back to that relationship that regulates. And centeredness is another quality that is inherent. It's like the earth has a center and, and the, the earth revolves around the center of the sun and the, the solar system, you know, is, it revolves around the center of the galaxy. And we have a center. Every, everything, every object has a center. And when we live in the head, we lose our center. So there are all these qualities that are our reality. In reality, you are spacious, you are fluid, you are grounded, you are centered. But, but as we go into this hypervigilance of, of, of our culture, we not just lose touch with our being, but denature. Our experience of being. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned it's five qualities, uh, or did I hear? Good for you. The, the fifth, yeah, the fifth <laughs> quality is attunement. Attunement. Mm -hmm. So every everything is attuned to everything. 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a there's a, a mathematical physicist who showed that the gravitational field of one electron at the outermost fringe of the universe affects the movement of air molecules in the room you're in now. So we come out of attunement and live in the heads and and want to sort and know and categorize. But to come back to the body is to come back to the attunement that is already happening. So so the the fluctuations of the present are always moving through you. And you can either attune to those or dull yourself to them. Mm -hmm. And everything attunes and to come into harmony with the world sort of asks that you recover that ability to attune and trust it, not not wanting to, you know, how to attune without needing to organize or categorize or arrive at a conclusion, how to just feel and in that feeling to find guidance because we are always guided by the present. That's super interesting. I'm going to, uh, we don't have a lot of time, sorry. We, are, we have to finish very soon. I'm going to be a little organized. <laughs> there came a question, since we don't have a lot of time, I'll just read it out if you guys don't mind. Uh, sometimes we bring people up, but we, the conversation has been uh, interesting. And, um, and yes, I haven't dis gotten I distracted to that. Can I so, answer one? Trisha asked, uh, yeah. which one did I miss? Spaciousness. Mm -hmm. spaciousness, fluidity, groundedness, centeredness, attunement. <clears throat> so there's an interesting question. We only have a few minutes, so uh, I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, it came from Dwip. <laughs> Almost all self-development mm -hmm. and growth work points at working on the self, focus on the self, and from there, uh, all other relationships get better. But as being pointed out here to focus on relationships rather than being preoccupied with self, could you please clarify when to focus on the self and when to let go? So let's go back to attunement and spaciousness. What is the body? I mean, I, I essentially feel the body as a resonator. The body is like a singing bowl that attunes to the world. Now, if that singing bowl is stuffed full of sand, for example, it, it won't resonate. It won't sing. And that's what happens with our body. So yeah, inner work is important, but what you're doing is you're, you're recovering your spaciousness. You're taking that, those congestions that live in the body and integrating them. And as they integrate, the body becomes more spacious, more fluid, more centered, more grounded. And then, and then the attunement comes. So the inner work isn't the goal. The inner work is just to clear the body of what impedes its attunement um, and and then and then pay attention and then feel the present and then you know we, we think that I will discover myself and my truth by going deep inside and I don't believe that for a moment I discover who I am as I come into felt relationship with a, a blade of grass or a grasshopper or or a cloud I come into felt relationship with it or the moon at night and who I am is illuminated and the more deeply I come into felt relationship with the world around me the more deeply who I am is discovered by me so guys I see you are writing your questions here I hope we've got the answer uh, but we unfortunately only have a few minutes left because I usually finish a few minutes before before the hour uh, to have um, uh, to consider with with, uh, with with other speakers on our stage. Uh, but I do want to ask and I hope uh, we, we, Philip you can answer it uh, in, in a few minutes. What are some of the practice, practices that you you recommend to, to people who's, uh, who learn with you? And since we are on that, maybe you can also share if people want to go deeper, uh, if people want to, to, to train with you, where, where could they do that? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a couple of things. One, one is I, 
because the work requires constant reminding. I mean, we are living in a culture of forgetfulness and to, and to remember to remember is made more difficult by that. So there is a membership that I've got. It's a, like a monthly membership and you get two weeks free and there are practices, practices, practices. Um, and each practice is, is a way of resensitizing to a relationship that our culture has dulled us to. So there's, mm -hmm. there's information on that in my website, which is embodied present present yeah. dot com. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a course, there's one that's just finishing now, but there's one called recalibrate the self that I think is starting up in September. Again, um, I'd l there's lots of free stuff on my website. And of course, there are my books. Um, uh, Radical wholeness is is an easy book to start with. Um, my most recent book is deep fitness, which is overturning um, uh, so many misunderstandings about how to be healthy, what your body needs. Um, um, there. Visit my website. Uh, yes, I can type up the website. Meanwhile, guys, I'm so sorry I can't read out your questions anymore because we really don't have all that much time. Uh, I uh, wanted to traditionally ask you to actually I'll first type up the website name just in case I oh, know it's here my okay. valid team thank you <laughs> embodiedpresent.com uh, so yeah. uh, I want to traditionally ask um, since we are coming up to the very end my guests to leave a heart for my wonderful um, well our audience to leave a heart for my wonderful guest sorry, best of the words, to, for Philip. Those who are watching it in the recording, you can leave them in the comments below. Uh, and, you know, Philip, uh, maybe just as a parting message, uh, is there something that you could recommend uh, for, for our audience to do today to start feeling the world more than thinking the world? I would, I, you know what, I would, I would just say, spend five minutes and feel your breath as gently as you can and see where it takes you. That's, that's a very interesting uh, practice. Uh, I'll, I'll try it after we're done here. So spend five minutes to feel your breath <laughs> gently. The key word here is gently. And uh, thank you guys for joining me. And uh, thank you for your hearts. Thank you for your questions. Unfortunately, we had such an intensely deep conversation that I never got to, to bring you up on stage with me, but it happens. Next time, do ask your questions a little earlier and then I'll be more conscious of them coming in. Philip, thank you so much for finding time and for sharing your wisdom. I really enjoy philosophical conversations. They make me, uh, actually, they make me do come, <laughs> to, do come more in my head, but you know. <laughs> and there's value in that too. There's value. I, I guess there's an interview. I have to work with my head a little bit. <laughs> But thank you for, for shaking up uh, our realities and for making us, uh, I, I'm speaking for everyone here, of course, but for, for making me um, rethink or refeel what it means to think and feel and perceive. <laughs> anyway, thank you for confusing it. <laughs> maybe maybe oh, once we mess it up, it will all come back <laughs> into comedy. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been a joy. Thank you so much, Christine. And thank you, everyone. And I'll see you in a week, hopefully. And bye-bye.